Welcome fellow plant lovers. So, very often things go wrong in the world of plant growing, as you well know, if you watch my channel quite a lot. So as you can see here, things do sometimes go right. It's very, very lush in here. Everything's growing really well at the moment. And apart from a slight fungus gnat problem, which you can see a video on that I point to at the end. Apart from that, the plants are growing really, really well. Everything's going okay so far, touch wood. But it's very often the things that go wrong that we learn the most from. And my goodness, things do go wrong for me very often. So what we're going to do is go over to the greenhouse today and we're going to have a look at a slight change that I made which has resulted in a number of disasters and we can then hopefully have a nerdy plant chat about how I'm trying to put things right and hopefully that will also help you too with your problems and issues that you get with your plants. So let's head over there. And we are in. Okay so we're over in the greenhouse today and what we're going to do is have a look at several things that's been going on as a result of me lowering the temperature. So basically what I've done, I used to keep the greenhouse at a minimum of 12 degrees. Now through winter that means 12 degrees Celsius day and night as well. However when it comes to the springtime obviously the temperatures during the day rise but I kept it to 12 degrees at night. So what I did as a result of a number of things, mainly the cost, I've reduced it to eight degrees and I'll go into more detail about another reason why I've done that as we work our way through the video. I'm going to get you on the handheld camera, I'm going to have a look at one or two things, I'm going to discuss some of the issues that's been going on as a result of that drop of four degrees Celsius, just four degrees Celsius and how I'm trying to overcome those issues. So let's turn around and get on with it. Okay so we're going to start with the Mandevilla or Diplodenia as some people like to call them. So as you can see here there's a number Number of flowers on it. There's quite a few flower buds beginning to come now. Uh, flowers up there. Most of the flowers are up near the top there. I don't know if you can see those. I hope the light isn't too bright. And considering it's May, I normally have a lot more blooms on it than this. And this is as a direct result of me suddenly reducing the temperature by four degrees. Now, the reason that I did that was mainly because of the cost, of course. But I did see a talk by um, a lady at our local orchid society. This lady was well known nationally as a grower of cool orchids and she'd won awards for these orchids. So I asked her how cold do you allow your greenhouse to go and she said eight degrees Celsius and she listed off all the plants that she grew and a lot of them were similar to mine or the ones that I grew in the cooler side of the greenhouse. So I thought right well if it's good enough for her it's good enough for me and I'm going to have to change uh, as time goes on, especially as winter approaches, how I purchase plants and the kind of plants that I purchase for this greenhouse. So, the Mandevilla, yes, it will get knocked back if you do reduce those temperatures, but it's not as simple as that. Is it ever as simple as that with plants? Just see a couple more dead leaves there that need to come off. I can't help doing this as I'm kind of working my way around. I'm still getting yellowing leaves, as you do tend to at this time of year. But believe me, a minimum of 12 degrees makes such a difference. And if you can push it to 15 degrees Celsius or above, then that's where Mandevilla really, really thrives. You can see we're beginning to get now some of these twining stems. There's another one over there, which shows you that it's beginning to hit its straps now that we're into May. So, okay, I get lots of questions about Mandevilla, um, even though I've only really got this one. I've got a few cuttings. You might have seen recently, I've bought another one over here, only like literally this week, which should be a different color. Uh, but the, the main reason I get a lot of questions is that one of my videos or a couple of my videos that I made on Mandevilla seem to do particularly well. So I get a lot of questions about it. So I'll just go over a couple of things that I've picked up through the years of growing these, which actually isn't a great length of time. And obviously I'm growing it in a particular location. I'm not growing it in the soil. I'm not growing it outside. Uh, I'm not growing it in a hot or tropical country. I'm growing it in the UK in a greenhouse that's very, very shaded. This is a high light plant. You cannot give it enough light. I wouldn't like to give it direct sun through glass as I wouldn't like to give any plant direct sun through glass. 
but it wants as bright a light as possible and as best temperatures that you can give it. Somebody recently said to me, does it have like a maximum temperature? Well, I would say think about where it grows. It grows in a forest in a tropical area. So I would expect the fact that it's a climber would tell you that once it gets its head into the sun, it's quite happy there. I don't think, I think the sun would have to be really, really hot. You know, you'd have to have it in a really sheltered spot, maybe backed against a wall. Um, and get the sun on it all day long for it to really have an effect. The main problem is going to be if you've got it in a pot. That can be a completely different matter. If you've got mandevilla or any plant for that matter in a pot, then it's going to be a lot more stressed if it has like a direct sun or the sun is particularly hot and it's on that pot. So I would suggest that you try and somehow shelter that pot, either put something else in front of it or paint it white or whatever it is you can do to actually prevent it from getting too hot uh, and overheating those roots. That would be a really good idea uh, for any plant really if you've got it in a pot and you've got that, that maximum temperature. So as a rule of thumb, the, the, the high is not going to be the problem, it's the lows that's going to be the problem for you. There are a number of hybrids and we always go through the naming thing, don't we? Well Diplodini was actually retired as a genus in 1933, but the one that I've just bought, what does it say on it? It actually says, there you go, Sanderi Rosea Diplodinia, and Diplodinia is spelt incorrectly as well. So Diplodinia is still getting used as a genus even though it was retired. I think everything that was in the Diplodinia genus uh, was put into the Mandevilla genus. So its real name is Mandevilla and in brackets you could put synonym Diplodinia and then Sanderi is the species and, and the one that you've just seen anyway is Rosea. This one just came to me as Diplodinia Sanderi. So in terms of temperatures there are a number of hybrids that uh, will go down to like just above frost. So two or three degrees and they will survive. They're not going to thrive. They're not going to give you loads of blooms. They may even die right down to the ground. So you can have a mandevilla plant that's in the ground, dies down totally to the ground level and then comes back up again next year. Now that's dependent on a lot of things, uh, not least of which is the maturity of the plant. A more mature plant is more likely to come back. A less much your plant is less likely to come back. One little trick that you can try, and I've not made this up, but one little trick you can try with any plant for that matter, especially a woody one, uh, if all the leaves have fallen off it but you've still got some stems like this above ground, get yourself a knife and just scrape uh, the outer layer of bark and you can see there if it's still green then that means there is still life in that there plant. Doesn't necessarily mean that it won't still die off, but at least you've got some hope for it. So I thought I'd just show you that uh, as a little tiny tip or trick there if, if your plant does completely defoliate, okay? So Mandevilla, for me anyway, I think this is going to be not quite a 10 month of the year bloomer. Uh, certainly when we get to autumn and winter and those temperatures drop, then I think it's likely that I'm going to get a lot more yellowing leaves and a lot less blooms, but that's just the way it goes. If the prices of electricity do actually drop, then I may well increase that again at some point. So this is my, talking about failures, this is now my accident and emergency section for orchids. Every single winter I get a lot of orchids that rot their roots and I've gone through uh, various stages and an evolution in in various media trying different things. I've even bought myself some lecker. I'm going to have a go at that. So all of those that you can see there with perhaps bar one or two have practically no roots on them at all and all of them, and this is my latest thinking on it, is I wonder if I can actually get these to regrow root by doing something particular. And what I've actually done is I have left them loose and I'm basically just keeping an eye out for any new growths that's coming on them. And you can just see a new growth there. Once the new growth comes, sooner or later we should get a root underneath. And when that happens, then I'm just going to pick it up and spray it and spray a little bit of the moss that it's sitting on. It has actually started to happen in some of them. There's another one, another new growth on it, no roots on that one yet. This way I know they are drying out. 
because they're not sitting in anything wet. They're not surrounded by anything wet. This one does have uh, a new growth on the, again, no new roots as of yet. I would expect a lot of people would throw these away and I would have done in the past, but just a little experiment to see what will happen. Great big growth on there, no roots at all as of yet. I'll come across one with some roots on sooner or later, I'm sure. Uh, another new growth on that one, can't see any roots on that one either, but they'll come. I have a twinkle over here, I'm sure this one has. Right, you might laugh at this. So look how small that is. Tiny little growth, couple of little growths, in fact, three little growths, but can you see a root? So I need to, make, to absolutely ensure that this dries out. And by the way, apologies for my green fingers. My fingers are actually literally green. I've just come from work and obviously I've been uh, doing lots of gardening for people. I even have green knees, believe it or not, at the moment. So yeah, that has a little root on it. And what I'm going to do is ensure that that root gets some water. I'm not going to pot these at all, not in the traditional sense. I'm not going to surround them by any kind of media. They're just sitting on top and I wait for the roots. And when the roots come, I'm going to spray the roots on a daily basis and just a little bit of the moss. So that's my latest thinking on orchids and see if we can actually rescue some of these orchids. And I may even, I mean, I know different orchids where you do different things with, but I may even on some of my other orchids that tend to lose a lot of roots over the winter months, I'm going to try moss because uh, I can guarantee that moss will dry out. You know, I can put lots and lots of ventilation around, which I've already tried, haven't I? I've already done that. And I've already tried some of the thicker coconut husk to see if that will also dry out a lot quicker. But even with that, I'm finding that it just doesn't dry out in a greenhouse environment or in my particular workspace. So that's something that I need to get on with. Okay, so as I now have a new environment or a different type of environment. I need to think about cooler growing plants and things like this Dracula Chimera. Now just look how many spikes I've got on here. If all these come into bloom, then it's going to look absolutely superb. And I've had this a while. I've had it over a year. So I know it doesn't rot its roots and I know it seems happy enough, which stands to reason because it's a cooler growing orchid and there are lots of them. Now come and have a look at this one because this is my pride and joy at the moment. I believe they don't last very long. Well, this is my Dendrobium densiflorum, which is another little bit of evidence that I can grow some orchids. Not all of them, but I can grow some. And um, this one, again, didn't seem to suffer at eight degrees Celsius, but it's given me this fantastic, uh, what would you call that? Would you call that a peduncle of blooms, an inflorescence, I guess? Uh, of blooms, absolutely stunning. And I have to say that's probably the, one of the nicest or most eye-catching orchids I've ever grown. Now, why didn't it do that last year? Well, mainly because uh, I wasn't watering with a pump action sprayer. So I was dunking them. Um, the fact that I had to get hold of the whole thing and dunk it in like a big trug of water meant that I was a little reluctant to do that just simply because it was a bigger job. It's much easier to pick up a pump action sprayer, there it is down there, um, to spray these things on a daily basis. And I'm really, really hoping my Dendrobium Victoria Regina comes up with a nice bloom as well. It's certainly looking nice and plump. Uh, so that one's Densiflorum. That one is the other Eflorum one, which I can't remember what it's called. Uh, it'll come to me or I'll stick it up on screen. Uh, that one hasn't done quite as well. I've spread it in the same way. Uh, maybe it's just not that mature yet. So I need to change what I grow in here. Mastervalias will be a good one for me. They all just seem to do well for me. I've got a number of Mastervalias here, just waiting to throw up some blooms. Uh, definitely Drosera and carnivorous plants and Nepenthes can all do really, really well with lower temperatures. You know, obviously with the Nepenthes, you've got the highland and the lowland ones. And a lot of these hybrids uh, have such a wide range of temperatures that they can enjoy. Yes, there are lowland ones with 
which need much higher temperatures but I've got those in the hothouse I need to aim for the hybrids or the highland ones that don't mind going really low because don't forget a lot of these nepenthes come from higher areas like mountainous areas uh, in these tropical places so let's have a look at these Drosera because this one just keeps pumping out these fantastic I don't know what to call them really, I guess the leaves, modified leaves, with all this beautiful dew on them. They really do look better in three dimensions than what you're seeing here. Uh, I've got a couple of Venus fly traps there that have been kind of nursing back to health. And of course we've got the beautiful uh, little moccasins of Cephalotus follicularis. And this was the one that was split off. So this was all one plant and I've just split it off. So you've got some loads of beautiful new pictures on there and a few new leaves coming and it's going to bloom as well. I might as well show you my King Sunju. Can you see it now? It's actually uh, visible to the naked eye now. It's taking rather a long time to get to that height and uh, it's already catching a few little flies. Now remember I completely destroyed my Drosera capensis by forgetting to water it. I managed to split a few off so I've got a couple there that have regrown again. I think that one's had it. That was a Pinguicula, I think that's had it. Little Madagascariensis there looking quite nice. This one is for the rosettes, believe it or not. The other Drosera capensis that you can see in there are just self-seeded. And there's another beautiful one here. I think this is Nidiformis. Uh, that one's looking really nice. Got some really good photos of that. So yeah, I'm going to have to change. Oh, of course, the Pinguicula with a few fungus gnats on it there. I'm going to have to change what I grow in here. I'm going to have to try and focus a little bit more on cooler growing plants. Now, the Streptocarpus have also suffered. I'm beginning to get some blooms on them now. I've normally had blooms at this time of year, usually about mid-March. Uh, and of course, we are a couple of months on from that now. A uh, nice one over there. I think I did show that one on my last video. Uh, they're beginning to happen. Things are beginning to happen. Uh, you might notice a little white thing. <laughs> it's a little tablet in each of them. I've fed them all now and I'll show you what I feed them on in a little while. Just looking for any more blooms. Let's just turn around here with a few more blooms on that. The more warmer days we get, obviously, the better it's going to be for uh, Streptocarpus. Um, I can't actually see any more at the moment. Yeah, it's really, really slow for Streptocarpus. That four degrees you wouldn't think would make all that difference. So I've been using these. So these are actually from Dibley's where you get most of your Streptocarpus from or where I get mine from. And you basically just stick one of these in a month, make a little note of it, and then the next month uh, you do the same thing again and that gives them all that they need. You don't necessarily have to use things like this, specialist things, you could just use general plant food but I might as well go for uh, the experts version. I think four, four of them cost me £20, something like that, but seeing as I grow so many Streptocarpus I thought it was an investment worth having. Right, moving on. So this new plant will have to go into the hothouse as probably will that one. But I have a few pelagoniums which I did show you on my last video, one there, one there. This one is, I don't know what's up with it, but it just didn't, it didn't transport very well. I've cut a few dead leaves off it already. It almost seems as if it's dehydrated, but you know, the soil is nice and moist there. Talking about watering pelagoniums, I've recently shifted how I water them. I've always top watered them before and I've never really had much of a problem. But recently I saw something, I think it was Mr. Pelagonium, uh, recommended bottom watering them. So I've tried bottom watering them and it's made a difference actually, as it would do, you know, he's a show grower. Um, so this one, this one is a stellar one. So this is St. Elmo's Fire. And only when I started bottom watering it, did it really begin to come back to life again. Like the, the blooms were kind of crisped up a little bit as if it wasn't getting any water when it clearly was. So I've, I've totally changed my outlook on that. I'm going to try and that was Georgia. I'm going to try and actually bottom water them from now on. It takes a little bit more room up, unfortunately. That's a nice one, isn't it? That's a, that's a new one. That's looking good. Everybody seems to like this one. Uh, it's just such an unusual one. A little angel pelagonium there. That one definitely seems to be better bottom watered. 
um, that one was beginning to cause me some concerns and I think just the, the watering seems to have changed that. Now have a look at this one over here. So this one, you've seen this one before, but really bizarre thing. <laughs> it's, this one is Arnside Fringed Aztec and something has happened to it. Well, first of all, half of it died over winter. Don't know why these things just happen. Half of it died. And what I've actually done is I've root pruned it. So I've taken it out of its pot. It was in a much bigger pot than that. And I've literally got a knife and chopped right down. And you can do this with pelagoniums. It's perfectly safe to do it. And it's changed colour. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't understand it. I have seen other people talk about changing colours. It doesn't even look like Anside Fringed Aztec. I'm wondering whether uh, I've actually got a different one here. And I've been thinking it's Anside Fringed Aztec for the past 12 months. But that begs the question, where is my Anside Fringed Aztec if this one isn't it? Because I can't find it anywhere. Unless somebody's come in and pinched it. So I don't know. Has it changed colour? Is this a different one altogether? Or is that my Anside Fringed Aztec just basically showing some stress by giving me slightly different colour blooms? It's a mystery. Bougainvillea. Let's move on to Bougainvillea. Right, now, doesn't that look like it's wilted? Well, it always looks like it's wilted, constantly. Again, this particular hybrid, this is Brasiliensis. I should have gone for one of the more robust hybrids. I went for one that was a little bit rarer, a little bit more difficult to grow, and it's always looking stressed. I moved it to here from over there which is like the uh, away from the sun so that would be what would that be north south east west the western oh south I said, the western side that's the western side of the greenhouse and um, that side was cooler i mean the whole place is cool really but i moved it over here just purely because it will get a little bit more sun a little bit more heat over here and i do have a light up there that i've put there specifically to give it more light because this is a very high light plant and it would do much better in the garden in summer but i don't have it in the garden i have it in the greenhouse and that's where i want to keep it it may well be that i give up on this this year I think it will bloom and I think it will look really nice, but I don't like the fact that it's not thriving. I don't like the fact that it's constantly looking like the leaves are uh, just wilting, you know, and, and actually they were wilting, but even when I water them, it won't bounce back too much. You know, I've given it a really good water, enough for the water to come through. I won't water it again for a few days, but it's still, it will constantly look like it's wilting. And those of you who have followed me for a while know that I've constantly struggled with Bougainvillea. Okay, still talking about plants suffering from lower temperatures. So this was my Begonia fuchsioides. I say was. <laughs> it still is, but it's not looking very happy. Why? Because the temperatures are going down to eight degrees. It can cope with 12. It prefers a little bit warmer. So what needs to happen to that is I either need to just put up with it for a little bit longer or move it over to the hothouse, which is probably what I will do. Now this Begonia Bowerai is probably one of the only Begonias I have that just doesn't seem to mind going down to eight degrees. It doesn't absolutely thrive, but as you can see, it's quite happy despite the lower nighttime temperatures. And even now, even in May, we're still getting temperatures at this, you know, at low levels. We could even get frosts in May, till the end of May, in fact, at this part of the UK. So begonias don't like the cold. I knew that anyway. I've just left these things in here as part of the transition, I guess, and so that uh, I can see what happens with these things. It's all about experimenting, isn't it? So let's move on to the next topic. Now, using the sprayer has been absolutely fantastic for most of my orchids, except this one. So this is my Neo Stylist Lucineri, and this one just didn't like the sprayer. It really prefers to be dunked once a week and to be left for half an hour. Uh, I don't know why, that's just the kind it is, just to be awkward really, you know, I, I thought I would have like a method for all my orchids, but it seems not, it seems that I'm going to have to do some things differently for different orchids, and I, I suspect the same is true of the one Vanda that I've got, I think I'm going to have to dunk that one instead, despite giving it a spray every day, but I'm really happy 
happy with the way things have gone with the dendrobium densiflorum there as you can see and no doubt i put loads of pictures on instagram of that so if you're not following me on instagram get over there or get into the description and you'll find my name in there and you'll be able to look me up or there might even be a link i can't remember so this is the parent plant and i've shown you that before but i thought you could have another little look at it it is related to busy lizzie's if you're from the uk does it look like a parrot to you? I don't know. I think it's really nice. Quite happy with that one. Okay, speaking of other orchids that don't generally do that well for me. Now you would expect Dendrobium Cuthbertsonii to do really well. These are cooler growing orchids. Um, this is the only one that remains out of, I think I had about five at one point. Uh, this one has made it through the winter uh, that one's quite happy with me using the sprayer and it's got a few little buds on there so that's going to bloom the only problem with these as i can see is that they're not very long lived now, that lady i was telling you about earlier that did the orchid talk that kept all her orchids at eight degrees she also specialized in these and she did actually say and i was kind of cheering inwardly that very often they only live a couple of years years so that may well be why they die on you now mine in particular uh, that's exactly what they do they last a couple of years now here's me thinking it's the winter maybe it's just simply that they don't last very long they're not very long lived um, i don't know how true that is that's what she said maybe there's somebody out there who says well i've got some that live for x number of years maybe it's just our environment maybe she's just suffering from the same problems that i'm suffering from and for us in the uk that's all they're going to last so if anybody lives in a similar climate and has them that last for a lot longer then let me know i'll be really interested to find that out now just a little word on tradescantia now i know this one's growing particularly well because it's in a bag and it's rooted all the way down so i'm not getting those burst stems yet but if you have one that has burst stems actually we'll just have a look at this one over here because i think this one might have something like that well you can see what's happening here i did cut this one back actually there's a, a lot less or a lot fewer stems in this one you can see how they begin to go what happens to them um, what i kind of started thinking about was well i wonder if there's any way of like reinvigorating these dead sections of the Tredescantia of the plant. Now obviously we know what's going on in as much as these plants scramble and they like to root as they go. We don't grow them pr properly because we only have them rooted at one point. So they kind of run out of steam but I wondered if, obviously you can do what I've done like over here with this one with the great big one uh, if you do that it's a lot of work to set up but it certainly lasts a lot longer and gives you a better show but i wondered if i wonder whether we could actually tie some moss around these uh, leaf nodes here and actually get it to sprout roots because if we do then it's highly likely it might actually re-sprout some uh, some leaves and some shoots just a thought i might try that myself a little experiment to see whether that actually will solve that particular burst stem situation so that's a little tip on Tredescantia. And over here we have the Tredescantia Nanook, which I've been running a little experiment on. This one's looking better, seemed to do better, obviously, in the better temperatures. But somebody suggested, I think they were from India, actually, growing them in a clay pot because they also lived in a highly humid place. And they reckon that the clay pot seems to solve a lot of that issue. So maybe the issue is the humidity around the roots. Maybe they just want their roots to dry out or to exchange those gases with the roots so i've got that one growing in a clay pot and i'm going to try some of the others in a clay pot but over here we have one growing perfectly well in a plastic pot and that one seems to be doing okay at the moment too it doesn't seem to matter what i do with tredescantia nanook i end up with the same markings on the leaves i end up with the same poor growth um, and just at one particular time of year they just seem to think right that's it we're okay now we've had enough moaning and whinging we've had enough dying off we're going to come back and give you a nice show for a bit before things start to go south again i've never seen anybody yet with one of these that's been growing for a couple of years in the same pot still looking good i only ever see pots of cuttings when they're small the young and that's when they look okay 
there may be some out there, I don't know. I've talked about this before, my Frankmopedia mains worthy are, which is going to bloom and look absolutely dreadful all through winter. All these black marks on the leaves, same thing happened with the Bessie eye as well, even though that's blooming. Fortunately, we have some new growths on them, a load of new growths on that bit there, and there, and there are three different new growths on there. Nothing is going to return these leaves to their former vigour. Uh, I'm at a loss, I don't know what's gone on with that. Again, I suspect it's something to do with the humidity in the greenhouse. Although Ed from Ed's Orchids has assured me that it's not the temperature, it's not the lower temperature that, that is the problem. And it's not like I even spray the leaves. So I don't, I just don't know what's happened to that. They just, they just don't like it. Maybe it's the light again, the lighting issue. We've talked about that before in the past, haven't we? We've even measured it, that even with the grow lights, the light isn't that great in here. So I could go on and on, as you well know, there are loads of things to discuss still, but I think we better leave it at that. The videos run on quite a long time. And what I want you to do is tell me, what have you learned this week? Have you learned anything that you're going to apply to your plants, whether it's something you've learned from a YouTube video or whether it's something you've learned just from growing your own plants and looking at your mistakes and looking at your errors and learning from your failures? Because that's what I do all the time. In fact, sometimes I even have to relearn something that I've learned already once before. I think that may be an age thing. So I'll leave it at that for now. And if you are struggling with fungus gnats and you've not seen the video on this yet, mine seems to be solved, thankfully. Although <laughs> it may come back and bite me at some point. But I'll have a look at this video up in the corner right now and go and watch that if you've not already seen it. So for now, I'll see you on the next one. Bye.